This message tonight is called God of the Breakthrough. God of the Breakthrough. And I don't know what you're hoping for in your journey right now, but God is able. That's the message tonight. But here's the way God works. God typically invites us into the process. See, we have a tendency to say, God, I need you to work. Now, I'm going to just sit back and pray and trust that you'll work. And God says, I would like to work, but I wouldn't like to invite you into the process with me. We're going to end this message at the walls of Jericho, a story that most people who've been around church know, where seven times around the fortified city, God delivered Jericho into the hands of of the nation of Israel, one of the first victories as they enter into the promised land. But here's what happens in Joshua chapter 6. God says to Joshua, I'm going to give you the city. In fact, I've given you the city. I already promised that to your forefathers. I promised that to Moses, and I'm promising it to you. I'm going to give you the city, but here's what I need you to do. Organize the people, get the priests, get the Ark of the Covenant, and make one lap around the city on the first day, another lap on the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. You're going to do a little different uh, plan on the seventh day. So see what God did. He said, I'm going to give you the city, but now here's what I need you to do. Okay, the amens just went down. I said, God is able. We had like near broke out revival. I said, here's what I need you to do. You could hear a pin drop. No, Lord, we want you to do it. You're the God of the breakthrough. We need you to make the breakthrough. We need you to make a way. We need you to bring the walls down. We need you to part the sea. We need you to do it. And he says, okay, I'm going to do it. Now, here's what I need you to do. I need you to step in with me in the process. God's working all around us all the time. God's doing miracles in our lives that we see and don't see all the time. Who knows how many times angels stepped into our story today. God's always at work all around us, but God is also inviting us into the story. So this series is called Extravagant. We call it extravagant because we have three anchors at Passion City Church. The glory of God. These are our theological pillars, if you will. This is what our whole house is tied to in a sense of mooring to these big anchors. The glory of God, radical grace, and extravagant worship. You can sum up everything we do at Passion City Church with the glory of God. It's his story. He's the star of the story. He's the center of the story. This church and our lives are all about him. But this glorious God has extended radical grace to you and me. Not grace to get us from hell into heaven, grace to get us through Thursday, and grace to get us through the valley, and grace to get us up the mountains, Christ in me, the hope of glory. And in light of a glorious God who's extended radical grace, we want to respond with extravagant worship. We do not want to offer God less than what God has offered us. However, we get into an earthly economy with God that goes like this. I love the fact that God gave 100%. You sing a song about Jesus laying his life down for me, climbing up a mountain for me, tearing down a wall for me. Lighten up the darkness for me, coming after me. You sing a song about the one who paid it all, broke my chains, set me free, gave his son, paid the price. I'm going to go, yeah, I praise you for giving 100% for me. Now, I'm going to need a whole series on giving to give 10% of what I've got to you. You're like, 10%? What's 10%? I'm going to give what seems good, what seems convenient, when it all fits together, when I'm in the mood, when everybody else is on board, when life is good and I can see what you're doing, I will give some, but it's very rare to find a moment, if I can be honest, where any of us like totally just say, I'm all in, 100% of me. And it's not a big deal because I'm responding to 100% of you. And 100% seems like it beckons 100%. That's extravagant worship. That's a life of saying, I want to honor you in every single way. 
And I believe it's all tied up in the idea of sacrifice. This series is built around sacrifice, his and ours, his 100% Christ given for us, ours, our lives, and everything we are in response to what he has done for us. We saw this in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 and 16. Now, Hebrews, if you don't know much about the book, and it helps to know sort of what the books of the Bible are about so you can know what the verses in those books of the Bible are about. And Hebrews is about a teaching that was coming into the early church wanting to pull people back to the old Jewish system, pull people back to the law, back to the temple, back to the sacrifices. But what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, we're not going back. Jesus has set us free. Jesus is the final sacrifice. Jesus has made a way. We are not going back to a system. We're not going back to religion. We're not going back to the old way of doing things. We are staying with Jesus. And so when you come to the last chapter in this book about not going back and come to these verses, verse 15 and 16, you get the backdrop and you understand what worship really looks like. The verse opens this way. Through Jesus, therefore. Can you read it with me? Through Jesus, therefore. Let's try it together. Through Jesus, therefore. So what we're talking about tonight is coming through the lens of the finished work of Jesus. Coming to church through the finished work of Jesus. Coming to worship through the finished work of Jesus. Coming into the house at the five o'clock through the finished work of Jesus. Coming into Monday through the finished work of Jesus. Coming to above and beyond Sunday through the finished work of Jesus. Coming to our decisions in life through the finished work of Jesus. Man, I want to be a part of a church. I got to tell you, where people don't just come through physical doors, but they come through the doorway of the finished work of Jesus. Both in D.C. and Atlanta, five o'clock, amazing door holders, beautiful people, opened a physical door for us to come into this gathering. But Jesus, the ultimate door holder, opened a spiritual door for us to come into this gathering. He's got nail-scarred hands, and he held open the veil of the temple so that we could come into the presence of a holy God. He paid and paved the way so that we could come from wherever we are, whoever we are, into the very presence of God in this gathering. So when you came through the physical doors, that's great. But if you hadn't come through the spiritual doors, then you got to your seat, looked around, kind of decided what you felt about everything, sized up the band when they came out, looked at the words on the screen, and maybe took a minute to go for it. Versus coming in the door, I want to go to a church. Don't you want to go to this church? I want to speak this over our church. And our church is very much on the way to this. I want to go to a church where people come through the doorway of Jesus. They get to their seat and they say, kind of under their breath, I'm ready for this thing to start. I am ready to worship the living God. I am ready to exalt Jesus. When the band comes out, I'm going to rip their head off. The first note, I'm going for it. I'm not looking around. I don't need a warm up. I don't need a fast song. I don't need a call to worship. I came through the doorway of the finished work of Jesus. That doesn't mean my life is great. On the contrary, life might be really hard. But I came through the finished work of Jesus. And I want to go to a church just to kind of put it out there. I I did this this morning, and then I felt like it, it maybe was a little too pastoral, so I decided not to do it tonight. But then I changed my mind. Um, I want to go to a church where people don't leave till it's over. Can I speak that over Passion City Church? Could that be our church? Could it be our church that people are like ready at the drop? I'm not 100% because we're going to have guests and we're going to have somebody wandering off the street and we're going to have somebody that just came from a you know, another church and maybe their tradition was a little bit different. So that's cool and that's always acceptable. We got somebody that doesn't even know Jesus yet. People are just checking things out. All that's great. So it doesn't have to be 100%, but like 90%, I mean, on from the drop. And then nobody leaves. Because who knows, that last song might not be the last song. 
People say, well, you know, we just dart, darted out during the last song. I said, what if during the last song, God moved and revival broke out? And in the history of the church, your family's legacy would be we left during the last song. <laughs> Were you at Passion City when, when it all broke out? No, we left during the last song. We, we, we just figured it was over by then. I, I want to go to a church. I want to speak over our church. I want to go to a church. And I know we can't get there by next week because, you know, two-thirds of our church isn't here this week. But I, I want to I wanna go to a church where people are ready to go at the drop and don't leave till it's over. Because they came through the finished work of Jesus. It wasn't like showing up for a sporting event and, oh, we know, well, it ended, and so it's time to bail, or they're, they're, we're ahead, so let's duck out early. It's not a, an event of some kind. It's a gathering of God's people, and anything is possible. And I didn't just come through a physical door. I came through Jesus. And when I come through Jesus, this all makes sense. Let us continually, can you say continually? So worship isn't an appointment or a scheduled event. It's, a, it's an, a lifestyle. Let us continually offer to God, here comes our word, a sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips, he describes what a sacrifice of praise is, that confess his name. So in any place, at any time, in any circumstance, when we say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, I believe you're in charge, I believe you're still working, I believe you have a plan, I believe you're good, I believe you're sovereign, I do believe you love me, I believe you're the source, I believe you can do miracles, I believe you're the great I am. Whenever we confess who he is in any place at any time, that is a sacrifice of praise. And it's mostly a sacrifice when the times are difficult more than it is when everything is great. Fruit of lips that confess your name. And a second thing, do not forget to do good, with, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. I got a whoa, thank you, and, and some maybe kind of an amen, D.C., and I don't know what I got from D.C., something I hope. But this phrase with words from our lips and the lifestyle that we live, doing good and sharing with other people, hello, we can move the heart of the Almighty. With these sacrifices, God is pleased. It's a miracle that he even knows. That he even notices, that he even sees, that it's even on his radar. Little bitty finite me can say something or act a certain way and move the heart of the almighty God. Did you ever think about that? You have the power to move the heart of God, and it's all wrapped up in that word sacrifice. It's not an Old Testament concept. It's not about law. It's not about regulations. It's not about ought. It's not about should. It's about grace because God didn't give Jesus because he ought to. He gave Jesus because he wanted to. The sacrifice of Jesus was 1,000% grace. Therefore, when we talk about sacrifice, we are not talking about law or legalism or rules and regulations. We're talking about, I want to do something that is appropriate and commensurate and proportionate to what you have done for me. I want to offer something that's costly and something that's precious to God. So what would a sacrifice of praise look like? A few little snapshots. Number one, a sacrifice of praise would look like someone sacrificing what they wanted so that someone that they don't know could have an eternity with Jesus. David Platt's message last week rocked our house. I'm going to sacrifice what I could have so that someone I don't even know on the other side of the, of the block or on the other side of the planet can have an eternity with Jesus. You're like, well, why would I do that? Because I 
came to see what God sacrificed so that I could have an eternity with Jesus. Therefore, it seems right to me to sacrifice something I could get, a new pair of kicks or a trip with my friend. I'm going to sacrifice what I could get, what I want, so that someone I don't even know could have an eternity with Jesus. A sacrifice could look like singing when the darkness closes in. Paul and Silas, Acts 16, middle of the prison, midnight. What are they doing? Singing hymns of praise to God. Totally counterintuitive to the seeing world, but makes perfect sense to the believing world. Because when you are down in the bottom and everything has gone opposite of what you had hoped or planned, what else is there to do but to cry out and call out to the God of heaven and the God of earth? And as they sang the hymns of praise, all the prisoners were listening, but the prisoners weren't the only ones listening. Heaven was listening, apparently, because the wall started to shake, and the chains started to break, and the prison doors swung open. And that night, the jailer and his family got saved and got baptized. Not because of extraordinary boldness, but because of extravagant worship. And what was the extravagant worship? It was a song in the night. A song in the day is good. I, don't, I wouldn't uh, belittle a song in the day. If you get blessed, give God praise. If you get a miracle, give God praise. If God does something that you uh, have been hoping for and praying for, give God praise. But when the darkness closes in, when it doesn't all add up, when you can't see past your face, when you cannot make sense of the circumstance in the situation, but you still believe in God, you still believe in Jesus, you still believe in the one who gave 100% so that you could be alive, you praise him, you bless him, you honor him, and proclaim him in the middle, you garner the attention of heaven, and you move the heart of God. And you move the heart of the people around you. Because the world expects Christians to praise God when they get bonuses. But the world is perplexed by Christians who praise God in the dark. Another glimpse of what a sacrifice of praise would look like is giving when you don't have enough. See, the seeing world says you give once you've received. But the believing world says you give in order to receive. You give because God is worthy. You give not out of fear that, wow, this is my last little bit. If I give this, I won't have any more. You give going, this is my last little bit. Thank God I'm giving it to the one who owns everything. I'm going to have enough if I give this to him. That's the story that we see in Luke. In Luke chapter 21, I love these four verses because Jesus is paying attention, people. And that is a mind-boggling thought to me. God has a lot on his plate, but somehow he notices things. It says, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small, not just small, copper coins. Think about it. Got rich people coming in, popping in big gifts. Got widow coming in with two little copper coins. Think about this woman. She's a widow. So A, she's already at a disadvantage in this culture. B, her coins are very small. See, her coins are copper, not the bling of the gold and the silver of the day. But Jesus said, I saw. They weren't too small for me to miss them. I noticed them, two of them. I saw what they were made out of, copper. And I saw the precious woman who brought them, this widow who I have my eye on. Jesus sees it all. And it moves his heart. He gives a little commentary, and I love it. He said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. Think about that. I don't know what these others were putting in, but we know that in the economy of God's kingdom, what we invest into the hands of God is forever into our future in heaven. Don't lay up for yourself treasure on earth where moth And rust can corrupt and thief can break in and steal. But lay up treasures for yourself in heaven 
where there is no corruption and there is no thief to steal. Whatever you lay up in heaven, you've got for eternity. So if these rich people made it to heaven and this poor widow made it to heaven, she would be loaded and they would be frustrated. Man, we put in a lot, not as much as her. And here's why. Here's why he could say that. The next verse says that all these people gave their gifts out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. What we talked about when we were talking about Mount Carmel a few weeks ago was the sacrifice that was on the altar that day that brought down the fire of heaven was faith. It really wasn't about the wood. It wasn't about the stones. It wasn't about the bull. And it wasn't about the water and the trenches. It was really about Elijah's faith that God was going to come through. Faith, the Hebrews writer says, is the one necessary ingredient to please God. The Hebrews writer writes that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So, so what would you bring God? I mean, that's the question I've been wrestling with. I mean, we talk about it in our world like, what do you get the person who has everything? You know that person, right? What do you get the person who has everything? Frustrating. Gift card to Chili's. And then when we get there, we say, I didn't know what to get you because you already have everything. Well, if that's true in human terms, how much more true is it on spiritual terms? What do you get the God who has everything? Oh, we're going to sing you another song tonight. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you. I have 10,000 times 10,000 angels, and I got these seraphs, and they just holy, holy, holy me all day long. And I've got people on every continent and every city and every language right now singing me worship songs. That happens pretty much 24-7, 365 days a year. I got Sirius over here. I got Spotify channels playing nonstop. I got little Bible studies meeting. I got people running on the trail. I got people in their cars. I got churches that are meeting. I got, I got songs coming. Well, we're going to sing you another one. How great is our God. He's like, oh, cool. That's awesome, man. I'm getting that from, what are we getting it from right now? 44,827 locations. Come on, join in. And he's just going like, I feel more like God all of a sudden. What do you get to God who has everything? Attendance at a gathering? Couple bucks in a bucket? I'll tell you what he wants, and I'll tell you what will move his heart. Your faith, your trust, you putting your faith on the altar and saying, if you don't come through, I'm hosed. But I believe you're going to come through. I'm putting my two copper coins in. It's the last thing I've got to live on, but I'm putting them into the hands of a great and mighty God, and I believe you're going to come through for me. I can't wait to get to heaven and hear the end of this precious widow's story, because I promise you there is a phenomenal ending to her story. See, where there is no sacrifice... There is no worship. And sacrifice is faith. So when faith and trust are on the altar, I promise you the fire of heaven will fall. And when the fire of heaven falls, revival will start in your heart. Yes, we want it in our church. Yes, we want it in our city. Yes, we want it in our generation. And yes, we want it across the earth. But it has to start somewhere. And the somewhere is in you and in me. And the way revival starts in my heart is when my faith and trust are on the altar of Almighty God. And I say, I have no king but you. I have no hope but you. I got no backup plan but you. We put all the fire and all the wood, I mean, all the wood and all the stones and all the water on the bull. And if you don't come through, we're out. And heaven sees faith and fire falls. And without fire fallen, you've just got form with no power. The church of our generation. But don't you want the power? 
and not just the form. And what would you bring a God who has everything? Well, A, it's two things, really. One is your affection. Because there's one thing nobody in these two gatherings can give God but you, and that's your affection. I can't tell God you love him and your trust. And when you put trust on the altar, I promise fire is going to fall from heaven. A fourth way that we see a little glimpse into what sacrifice of praise looks like is when we respond simply because we're overwhelmed by grace. This woman that we read about in Luke chapter 7, she came to that dinner where Jesus was reclining at the party that the Pharisee had thrown, and this woman of the night slips in, and at the end of the sofa where Jesus is reclining, she kneels down, pours, it says, an alabaster jar on his feet of perfume, and then sheds tears on his feet and wipes them with her hair. She, she didn't add it all up. She didn't, on the way over there, go, OK, I wonder how much this jar is worth. Should, we, should I put 10%? That's acceptable. From the Old Testament, I heard some of the teachers of the law say, if you just tithe, that's good. And so I could just give 10% and uh, come back next week and give 10 more percent. No, she just said, I had no shot. I had no grace. I had no mercy. But this man gave me grace, and this man gave me mercy. And she didn't even think about it before she just took what was precious to her and poured it on his feet. Just moved by grace and moved by mercy. As we come to above and beyond, this is what I believe. We could show a 1,000 videos about how God has changed lives at Passion City Church. We could preach all the sermons in the world about how generosity is the way that leads to freedom in our lives. We can have the best looking letter come in your email. We can uh, put great graphics in and put great stories in motion. But until you and I are moved by mercy and captured by the grace of Almighty God, we're never going to really fully pour out a sacrifice of praise that moves heaven heaven and moves earth. But when we see grace, you don't need a preacher. You don't need a story. You don't need above and beyond. You don't need anything. You're just overwhelmed by grace. And all of a sudden, the whole alabaster jar just goes onto the feet or the head of Jesus. Another little glimpse of a sacrifice, and I love this one coming back to where we started, is when we worship until the walls come down. Your breakthrough and whatever you're praying and believing for in your life is most likely contingent to you not giving up on the belief that your worship can break down walls. See, I, I can only imagine how foolish it looked to the natural world to see the Israelites walking around this fortified city with the priests and the preachers out in front and the Ark of the Covenant, the glory and presence of God, and they march around a lap and go back to the camp, come back tomorrow a lap and back to the camp. By the third day, I'm sure they're getting heckled royally from the walls of the city. And here come the Israelites on day three. Yes, the priests again are in the lead. Look, the Ark of the Covenant's rounding the north corner just now. How's it going down there, people? Fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, looks crazy. You got to know people were at the tent saying, I'm not going today. I'm not going today. I don't know what we're doing. I don't know what this is about. Doesn't seem to be doing anything. The walls just look bigger and bigger to me every day we go around them. But there was a promise on the seventh day, on the seventh lap, when God gave the command, the trumpet would blow, the people would raise a shout, and when they raised a shout, God would move. See, here's the beauty and the power that is yours in worship. Not that we see God move and then we worship him, but we believe that when we worship him, God moves. So many times we're waiting, okay, I'm going to see how it plays out, and then I'm going to worship. And God's saying, no, 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 don't stop worshiping, because as you're worshiping, that's how it's going to play out. 
And so quickly we turn to why and what happened and where are you and what's going on and I thought you were going to do this and then I saw you do that and I don't understand if you've forgotten us and what's the plan and why are we out here and how long is this going to take and we thought you would have worked by now and he's saying just hang in there in belief, just hang in there in confidence, just hang in there in faith and don't stop proclaiming my name into the storm, into the circumstance, into the situation up against whatever the walls are. Don't stop proclaiming that you believe in a great God. I don't know. I'm not offering a formula. I'm not saying to you, praise God every day in the face of whatever it is that's closing in on you, and by this time next week, you're going to have your breakthrough. I'm just saying there's something powerful about living out the reality that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That if God is for me, two verses down, who can be against me? That if God coming down the paragraph did not spare his own son, will he not freely give us all things? Coming down in the paragraph two, who can separate us from the love of God? A believing that I don't have to see God and understand the way he works to believe God and to know that he is working. If you want to live a revolutionary life, if you want to exceed the norms and experience the supernatural, then let God shift your thinking and renew your mind to this one concept that no matter what I see in the natural, God is working his plan. No matter what I can understand about the circumstance, God is doing something amazing. He is always doing something. He's always doing something good, and he's always doing something amazing. He is never not doing anything, and he's never doing something bad, and he's never doing something ordinary. God is always at work, always doing something amazing, and always doing something for our good. Now, I say that with this hashtag on my hand and a thousand other hashtags that any one of us could name in this moment. I say that journeying through a barren land, all glitz and glam to the natural world, but a broken down dream to the spiritual mind is this world in which we live. And on that journey, God has proven at Calvary that he is above it all. And he said, in this world, you will have trouble. But don't ever forget, do not ever discount, do not ever count me out because I have overcome the world. Heaven gets more and more real, the darker the night, the deeper the pain, the tougher the sorrow the greater the loss. Heaven stops being a theory and it starts being a reality. It stops being some kind of by and by pie in the sky and it starts being something that's drawing us like a magnet forward in great hope and faith. Of knowing that our loved ones are there. Our sacrifices are there. Our savior is there. Our investments are there. Our 401k is there. Our healing in full is there. Our restoration is there. This is the promised land that we are headed to. And on the way, I believe God has a plan. On the way, I believe he's working. And I don't know how he's working. I don't understand all his ways. They're higher than my ways. His thoughts are greater than my thoughts. That's why I praise him even if. That's why I praise him even when. That's why I praise him no matter what. That's why I don't stop making laps in faith and I just want to encourage you don't stop circling your kids with a shout of praise the walls will come down don't stop circling your parents with a shout of praise 
Don't stop circling around yourself with faith and praise. Don't stop partnering with God who already told you he's going to do it. Believing that he is at work and believing that your shout can destroy a fortress. Oh, worship, that's for the creatives. I love it, all the musically inclined. That's the skinny jeans crowd for sure. That's those few minutes right before the preacher comes. That's a Spotify track or a new song I've heard. Oh, come on, worship is a song. Thank God for every one of them that exalts Jesus Christ and inspires us to be who we are in him. But worship is way more than some tangent for creatives. Worship is a force. Worship is a weapon. Worship is a tidal wave. It is a tsunami. It is the power of God, and it is in your mouth. God is saying, if you want to see the breakthrough, bring a sacrifice of praise. So how's the spirit stirring? Is it the two little coins or is a song percolating up even in the darkest night? Is it trading out something I could have gotten for me for something I can do for somebody else? Is all of a sudden an overflow and you're like, man, something just hit my heart and I just want to give. I don't need a plan. I just want to give in this moment. Or is it saying, I'm not going to stop? I'm not stopping. Man, I was, I was so close to stopping. In fact, I stopped for a while, but whew, I feel wind in my soul. God's given me the city, but he invited me to come and circle it in faith. And I'm not going to stop. Or maybe it's just a shift of mind. DC, those of us here at 515, maybe it's a shift of mind. I was struggling with 10% in response to a God who gave everything. I need a renewed mind. I need a turnaround in my thinking. I need an awakening to how beautiful sacrifice is. And I want to offer faith and trust to a holy God because I need fire to fall on my mountain.